Climate change is driven by humans and will affect us all, but it's not driven by everyone equally, and it doesn't affect everyone equally. And that's the topic of this week's healthcare triage. In the last 250 years, 77% of global emissions were emitted by Europe, North America, Australia, and Japan. Annually, a single American produces the same emissions as 581 people from Burundi, one of the smallest countries in Africa. And the wealthiest 1% of the population produce more than twice the emissions as the poorest 50% of the population. Across the globe, nearly 800 million people, mostly in developing countries, live both in poverty and at risk of severe flooding. Income loss due to climate change is on track to be more than 80% for several southern countries by century's end. And many southern countries are already significantly less wealthy today than they would have been without the effects of climate change. At the same time, carbon emissions from nearly all low-income countries have been negligible compared to those of rich countries. If carbon emissions were magically adjusted to be equally distributed across the globe, emissions from a citizen of the Democratic Republic of Congo would increase tenfold whereas emissions from a citizen of North America would drop over 70%. Vast differences exist within countries too. In East Asia, the bottom half of the population emits less carbon than the top 10%. The top 10% in North America also exceed carbon emissions from the bottom 50% in the country. And in fact, those 10% of North Americans make up the largest carbon footprint in the world. In short, the wealthiest people, the wealthiest countries, are driving climate change, while the least wealthy are and will continue to bear the brunt of it. Individuals in high-income countries are about five times less likely to be displaced by sudden severe weather disasters than those in lower-income countries. Existing inequalities are a double-edged sword when it comes to the effects of climate change. Low-income countries and marginalized groups are already more susceptible to the effects of climate change, and those effects will only worsen the inequality making it harder for them to cope. A greater number of disadvantaged groups, including sheep and cattle herders and ethnic minorities, live in areas that face greater challenges on a warming planet due to already hot and dry conditions. Droughts are already more common in rural than urban areas, and people living under the poverty line live in greater numbers in rural areas, leaving them more likely to experience drought. Occupation the choice of which depends heavily on things like wealth and social status, can expose people to more climate-related risks. This includes jobs that require working outside and or jobs that depend on weather patterns to be successful. Gender roles are also a large part of who bears more climate change burdens in some countries. In places where land rights are restricted for women, they are more likely to face climate-related challenges on the land they are allowed to use. In places where it is customary for women to collect water, Increasing water scarcity requires them to travel longer and longer distances in potentially hazardous conditions. Even in places where the advantaged and the disadvantaged are exposed to the same climate threats, the advantage come out on top. This is sometimes due to allocation of public resources after a disaster. Take New Orleans, for example, after Hurricane Katrina. Recovery efforts in low-income areas with predominantly black populations did not experience the same support and recovery efforts as higher-income, predominantly white neighborhoods. And to provide a second example, following a major flood in Bangladesh in 1988, a large portion of public resources were used to protect capital city residents from future flooding. Not only were these efforts not made to protect rural residents from flooding, the measures taken to protect the wealthier city residents actually increased future flooding risk for the rural population. But personal wealth plays a big role too. When you have money to fall back on, you're less likely to have to sell off assets during hard times. For example, Ethiopians living in poverty have had to sell off livestock in an attempt to get through times of drought. Not only did households living above poverty levels not have to do this, but they also often purchased the livestock from selling families for cheap. When you have more money, you have access to things like air conditioning to protect your health in extreme heat. You have access to more sturdy building materials so your house can withstand more severe weather. And if it can't withstand it, you have more resources to avoid being completely displaced. And speaking of health effects, wealthier places suffer less disease due to events like flooding, often because they enjoy better infrastructure, mainly meaning they are more likely to have access to clean water even after severe flooding. For example, following intense flooding in Mumbai, 
the incidence of disease was much greater in low-income slums compared to wealthier areas. On a global level, low-income countries are generally located in areas already more prone to drought and severe weather conditions. Compared to the fewer high-income countries located in similar places, they don't have the funds to institute protective measures and or recover from climate-related incidents. In some cases, the money spent on such measures by high-income countries is more than the entire GDP of many low-income countries. This is all awful. What can we do to make it better? For starters, climate-related policies need to place these issues at the forefront. When creating those policies, it will be critical to bring in the voices of the marginalized. The people and communities that stand to endure the biggest effects of climate change need a voice in how to address it. Policies made to reduce emissions must take into account how they might affect cultural practices and livelihoods. Community partners will be critical in helping us understand customs and norms that will ensure a mutual understanding, mutual benefits, and productive cooperation. And importantly, High-income countries need to gather the energy and the money to put these policies into action. Avoiding and or coping with life's challenges is easier for people who have more resources. This is a sad truth, made even more sad knowing that climate-related challenges are being severely increased by people with the most resources, while people without resources pay the price. We cannot, in good conscience, let this continue. Hey, did you enjoy this episode? You might enjoy this previous episode on climate change and mental health. We'd appreciate it if you'd like this video and subscribe to the channel down below and consider going to patreon.com slash healthcare triage where you can help support this show, make it bigger and better. We'd like to especially thank our research associates, Joe Sevitz and Edward Lillaholm, and of course, our Surgeon Admiral, Sam.